Cool. All right, thanks so much, y'all. So again, my name is Dustin Wright. Uh, really happy to be able to speak to y'all today about our work, which we showed at AKBC earlier this year. We were very, very happy we got best application paper. Um, yeah, so just to reiterate, this is a collaboration between UC San Diego and IBM as part of the AI Horizons network. Um, so yeah, let's get into it. So actually, the, the group that I was working in at UCSD is uh, Center for Microbiome Innovation. So a lot of what we're focused on is kind of the human microbiome and what kind of you know, AI solutions we can use to, to understand the human microbiome better and develop tools for understanding the human microbiome. And so one of the kind of major issues with studying the human microbiome is that the amount of literature is just growing exponentially. So there's huge increased interest in this field. There's been a lot of really great work coming out um, associating kind of the microbiome with different aspects of human health. And so with that, there's just this exponential increase in the number of publications. And so it's kind of one thing that the group identified is that it would be really useful to be able to have like a very easily searchable and sortable database of, of facts related to the microbiome which come from the literature. So at a very, very high level, the group is working on kind of building structured information from all this unstructured text data in the form of a knowledge base. And so for anyone that doesn't know, a knowledge base is essentially a graph database which uh, contains nodes and edges. The nodes are particular entities that we're interested in. So for example, different types of bacteria or different diseases. And then the edges are relationships between them. So if we're talking about going from kind of the textual example to how it would look in structured data, we have the sentence from uh, a piece of literature that says Crohn's disease is associated with bacterial dysbiosis that frequently includes, includes colonization by inherent invasive E. coli. So the nodes in this example would be the disease and the bacteria, so Crohn's disease and the bacteria inherent invasive E. coli. And the sentence is saying that colonization by inherent invasive E. coli is associated with Crohn's disease. So you have an edge that an increase in AIEC is associated with uh, Crohn's disease. Being able to kind of build this structure from loose text is really, really useful for people in the, in the microbiome community. For example, you know, clinicians can use it to help identify potential conditions, nutritionists can use it to potentially help develop nutritional supplements, and researchers can use it to kind of maybe find some un unseen connections um, and hypothesis for hypothesis generation. I so, noticed the word colonization is not highlighted, but it's very <laughs> important in that sentence. Right, so it, kind of the first step is just looking at association mm -hmm. and kind of like positive, negative, or neutral association. Um, so that's why, that's kind of but not it's why colonization that's, that is the important the trigger <coughs> word. What? It would be the trigger word. Colonization would be the trigger word for that. Okay. Yeah. So, anyway, so that's kind of a high level of what um, this could be useful for. Um, and so there's really kind of three major components to knowledge-based construction. So there's um, recognizing entities in text. So just saying that a particular span is a disease or bacteria. There's finding associations between them, otherwise known as relation extraction. So being able to see that you know an increase in AIEC is associated with Crohn's disease. And then there's um, what's known as linking or normalization. There's a ton of different names that it goes by. But that's going from entities that you found in text and grounding them in an ontology. So kind of normalizing across the different ways that you can name things. So the main focus of this work was on the particular problem of normalizing disease entity names. And what that entails is essentially mapping names that we found in text, which we know are a disease, to some concept ontology. So in our case, we, we use we rely heavily on the CTP Medic Disease Dictionary, which is a structured ontology. It's essentially a hierarchy of diseases that comes with um, kind of preferred names, synonyms, definitions, all of this data, which is very, very useful for helping to, to build our models. Um, and the main thing is that they're all grounded in a single concept ID. And so essentially the task is if we have a sentence, say, adherent to base E. coli, it's mucosa associated bacterium often found in CD and we know that CD is a disease, we need to know what that particular disease is. So in the context of like the CTP Medic Disease Dictionary, 
It could be celiac disease or it could be Crohn's disease. So we need to be able to use different features of the text um, and different kind of contextual features as well as using the features in the ontology to be able to understand what the particular disease is. So the kind of state of the art methods prior to our work um, were mostly based on kind of feature engineering and shadow learning techniques. So the two major state of the art techniques were DNORM and TAGR1, which were both done by the same groups. And essentially, they, they do normalization in very similar ways. And the way that they do it is they use TFIDF vectors, which are essentially engineered features based on frequency counts of tokens and text. And they learn essentially similar, a similarity matrix. So they basically learn how to rank uh, the similarity between two different TFIDF vectors. For example, one coming from text and one coming from a name in the ontology. And whatever is the closest name in the ontology is what they'll normalize the disease to. So given this, kind of the major research questions that we had in this work were how can recent advances in deep learning be used um, for this problem of disease ending normalization? There had been a few attempts before us, but most of them didn't show too promising results. They couldn't quite be as performant as the shallow learning techniques. So we were interested in kind of how can we approach this problem from a neural net perspective and, and see performance gains or at least achieve state of the art. The second question is what aspects of language can be useful to help with the problem of disease entity normalization? And so this really goes hand in hand with kind of how can a neural model be used for this problem? So if we're using a neural model, what are the features that are useful for it? All right, and then finally, uh, and this is a critical problem which we needed to, to investigate in the context of using neural nets in this problem, is that given the lack of training data, labeled training data in this domain, kind of what are the sources of data that can be used to help improve uh, the performance of deep models in this problem? As probably many of you know, deep models are very, very data hungry. We need tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of different samples to be able to perform well on a lot of these problems. And within this domain, there's just not a lot of training data. So that's one of the kind of major questions we have in this work. So the rest of the talk, I'll kind of, I'll go through the first two points in depth, and then I'll talk about the third question, um, and then I'll talk about how we kind of evaluated our model and what kind of data sets we, we tested it on. So starting with the first two, we, we kind of took a two-fold approach in terms of the features that we were using, the kind of linguistic features that we were interested in. So essentially we're using semantic features which are kind of very, very popular in the context of neural models. Um, these are in the form of word embeddings and a very simple compositional phrase model. Um, and then contextual features which are also becoming increasingly popular uh, recently in the field. Um, so in terms of contextual features, there's really two different types of contextual features which could be possible that we could use. Um, there's local features, which are kind of features based on the surrounding text, the immediate surrounding text of a mention, and then global features, which is what we were looking at. So we didn't use local features, we used global features. And the global features we use are is uh, entity coherence. So essentially, we're trying to uh, normalize the diseases within a piece of text to a coherent set of diseases. This is kind of motivated by the idea that um, Crohn's disease is much more likely to appear in context with celiac disease than it is with something like brain tumors or congenital abnormalities. In terms of the architecture, the, the way that our kind of workflow is, is that we start with unstructured text. We, we tag the text with some external taggers. So we get all the diseases within the, within the text. Uh, we then get semantic features for each of the, the entity mentions that we find. So we tokenize them, we get word embeddings, and we compose that into one vector representation of the phrase for each of the entities within the document. And then we have a coherence model where we pass, where we pass each of those um, phrase-based representations through this kind of coherence model to get a new representation for each mention based on the surrounding mentions. All right, and then finally, we use those representations to ground the, the classify the, um, each entity into its uh, concept. So I'll talk, go a bit more in depth into what each of these models is, as well as how we, we perform classification. All right, so the very first step is to get a vector representation of the phrase. We actually use a very, very simple compositional phrase model. Um, this was motivated by some work that Felix Hill did in 2016, where he basically showed that using a bag of words model and just training word embeddings for the task of um, phrase similarity and paraphrase, uh, paraphrase generation 
um, and learning sentence representations is actually uh, a very strong model for, for performing those tasks. So we kind of start with this very simple compositional phrase model where we take the word embeddings and just perform a backwards summation on them and then pass them through a linear projection. So this gives us our, our phrase representation. The next step is uh, our coherence representation. So kind of the, the previous work that has looked at coherence has tried to model it using kind of the joint probability between all the phrases that would appear in a particular piece of text. Um, the kind of problem with this is in terms of efficiency. So with that, it's either you have to solve an NP-hard NP problem where you're having to model the joint probability of all the diseases within a particular piece of text for all the different concepts in your ontology, or you have to use kind of hacks like uh, using like loopy belief propagation in the CRF. So you're kind of motivated by how can we get around this, this kind of NP-hard problem. And so the way that we uh, are, are modeling it is actually just using a single layer bidirectional brew network. So essentially what happens is we have all the phrase representations for a particular document, and then we pass all those representations through a bidirectional brew, and then at the output we have a new representation which is based on all of the surrounding mentions. Right? And then the last step is classification, and kind of the classic normal way that you would form classification for this problem is to use just a soft map. Um, one of the things we are also motivated by is this kind of data problem is, you know, how can we get around the lack of training data and be able to, to learn representations that are based on, or learn representations of all of the concepts in the ontology, which many of which don't appear ever in training. And so based on that, we decided to model, uh, to, or to perform classification by modeling this concept embedding space. Um, and what the concept embedding space is essentially a learned representation for every concept in the ontology. So there's, there's a vector representation for Crohn's disease, there's a vector representation for celiac disease, um, and, and we learn this representation while we train the phrase and coherence model, all right? And so then the way the classification is performed is we take those representations from the phrase and coherence model and we um, classify whatever the disease is, whatever the closest point in that space, that concept embedding space is, right? And then the embedding space and the whole, the whole model are trained, trained together. So by doing this, we, we can't use just you know, cross entropy as our, our loss. We have a, a different loss that we use. So we use this kind of modified margin ranking loss. Um, and essentially what you know, the margin ranking loss performs is, is it essentially takes a, uh, your predicted rep representation of a disease and the representation from the concept ontology and um, tries to make the ground truth representation from the concept ontology, so the correct disease, say celiac disease, and make it closer to your predicted representation. And then you take a bunch of negative examples and you try to force those representations to be further apart. So the kind of modifications that we use is covered in this blog post if you're, you're interested in seeing kind of at a you know, deeper level what it is, but at a high level, that's essentially what we're doing. Right? So that's all kind of the modeling. In terms of implementation, we use uh, PyTorch. We pre-train all of our word vectors using word to vec on all of PubMed and PubMed Central, so we get good starting representations based on biomedical tech. Um, we initialize our concept embedding space using the ontology. And so this is actually one of the benefits we get by by modeling the by modeling or, or by performing classification this way, is that all of those embeddings in our concept embedding space we can initialize using the name from the ontology. So essentially, we take the preferred name for all of the, the names of the ontology and we, we do a summation of the word embeddings for each of those names and initialize the concept embedding space that way. All right, and then finally, we combine the predictions from the phrase and the coherence model using a learned parameter. And the motivation behind doing this is that we can actually use the names from the ontology to train the phrase model on its own. Um, and the reason why we want to do that is so that we can learn how to classify every concept in the ontology and not just the ones we see in, in the training data, which is very, very sparse. So we, we can train this phrase model on its own using the names in the, in the ontology, and then we combine the predictions from both the phrase model and the coherence model when we perform classification. All right, so that first part was all kind of modeling and um, those first few research questions of what linguistic features we were interested in. The next part is data augmentation. So 
essentially the problem is that these data sets have very, very limited training data on the order of thousands of examples, um, in like low thousands of examples. Uh, so essentially to try to train a neural model on this, we, we have to perform some sort of data augmentation in order to, to be able to train good representations. So to overcome this problem, we essentially use two techniques to augment our training data, uh, both of which are coming from the same data set. So we use this BioASQ data set, uh, and the way that, that the nature of that data is it's PubMed abstracts, which is kind of the same as the data that we use for training evaluation. Um, but the mentions themselves aren't labeled. The documents are labeled with the concepts that are, it appear in them. So for example, the, a document we labeled with, we know that Crohn's disease and celiac disease both appear in this document. We don't know where they appear. So starting from this data, we wanted to see, okay, how can we kind of leverage this to, to augment our, our training sets? So the first way is by using distancy provision. So essentially the way that works is we, we take all of the concepts which we know appear in a document, and then we take the names for those concepts that are in the ontology, and we just do a plain dictionary match. So we match uh, preferred names and synonyms to the spans in text and get labeled data that way. Right? And then the second method is using uh, synthetically generated data. So we, we take the concepts which you know appear within documents and get co-occurring statistic, statistics for all of them. Um, and then for each iteration of training, we generate random samples for all of the concepts in the ontology based on those co-occurring statistics. So some set of what is allegedly um, kind of coherent sets of documents based on those, or, or coherent sets of concepts based on those um, co-occurring statistics. So going into the numbers, th this is kind of the statistics for the data sets which we use to evaluate on. And if you just take a quick look, you can see that there's just not a lot of training data. Um, the NCBI disease corpus has only 793 articles and less than 7,000 annotations. And the biocreative um, chemical disease relation corpus has you know 1,500 articles and less than 13,000 annotations. So just not a lot of training data if you want to train a neural model. In terms of kind of mentions as well, one thing that's really interesting that's not reflected essentially in this table is that um, within training and tests, there's a huge disparity in terms in terms of the the concepts that we train on. So in test set, for example, in biocreative, about 30% of the disease concepts don't ever appear in training. So our models can learn nothing about them, essentially. Um, and so kind of some insight into this as to why the shallow learning techniques work is that they're entirely based on surface text features. So TF-IDF, you're just learning basically how to map between frequency counts um, of the tokens. So those methods are a bit more robust to this kind of disparity between um, you know, training data and test data. All right. Now, with our distance supervision, though, we get a huge boost in the terms of um, the diversity of concepts that we train on, as well as the number of examples that we, we can train on. So this gives us kind of a huge, huge advantage in terms of using a neural model, or a huge boost in terms of using a neural model, uh, as opposed to just using the data training data. All right, so the next part of the talk, I'm going to go into how we evaluate the model and kind of the the, the metrics we used and how our models performs in relation to, or as in comparison to the, the baseline models. So the first metric that we use is, the first two metrics we use actually are micro F1 and accuracy. Uh, these are the standard metrics for this task. Uh, basically the question that, that micro F1 asks is which concepts within a document do we recognize? And then accuracy is asking, using a perfect tagger, tagger how many of those predictions can be normalized correctly? So, very, very simple. One thing that we saw as an issue with accuracy, though, is that we have this concept of uh, an ontology. So there is some way that we can measure kind of prediction quality as opposed to just, you know, is it correct or not? Kind of, what is the quality of our prediction? And so we, we come up with this normalized LCA distance metric, which is essentially asking that question. And the way it works is, uh, I'll, I'll, so I'll give you an example, actually. So. We could have our ground truth concept be um, I optimality. Now, let's say we have two different taggers. The first tagger could predict that the disease was Crohn's disease, which has nothing in common with 
uh, ion anomalies, except for the fact that they're both diseases. And then our second dagger <laughs> could predict that the uh, correct concept was congenital abnormalities, which is actually the parent of eye abnormalities. So based on kind of its position in the ontology and the way it's way it would be used, we can say that predictor two is a much closer prediction to the ground truth than Crohn's disease, um, which is essentially if we use the distance between the two predictions and their most common ancestors, we can get a measure of prediction quality. So basically the way that that uh, metric works is we take those distances uh, to the lowest common ancestor and then average those over the entire uh, test set. All right, and then finally, we're looking at efficiency, which is essentially, you know, how long does it take to train a, a model given the same amount of training data? So going into the numbers, uh, for the NCBI disease corpus, um, our model, which is in blue, versus Tiger 1 in yellow and DNR in gray, uh, sees consistent gains. So we see a big gain in terms of precision, um, a nice gain in recall, and a, about 3% improvement in terms of, of F1. Um, on bio-created diseases, though, we, see, we still see a gain in terms of precision, but we see a slight drop um, in terms of recall. So overall, our F1 score was just slightly lower than the closest baseline. Um, and basically what this is saying is that our, our biggest gains are in the low resource setting. So on a data set which has a lower diversity in terms of the, how different mentions appear and the different concepts which appear in, in the data set, we can see gains. Um, and the reason why this happens is because we're using kind of the concept ontology for a lot of the augmentation. And so the extra data that we get is kind of low diversity in terms of the, the mentioned text that would appear. So because we're using just names from the ontology for our distance supervision, we're seeing you know, gains in terms of this, this closer, smaller set of um, mentions and concepts, but it hurts a little bit when the amount of kind of mentions that appear uh, and the types of concepts that appear is a bit more diverse. One way to mitigate this would be to improve our distance supervision, so that's one area that we could improve on for, for these models. All right, and then for accuracy as well, it's a very similar story. So we see very slight gain on NCBI disease corpus, and then a slight drop on biocreative. Uh, so one other um, kind of test that we did is seeing how robust the models were to abbreviations as well because all the models use this kind of abbreviation resolver to, to get rid of abbreviations when they can find them. And so when we remove abbreviation resolution, we actually see gains on both data sets. So our models are a bit more robust to abbreviations. <laughs> Next is uh, prediction quality. So we saw that our models were consistently better on both data sets in terms of prediction quality. Um, so essentially what this means is the concept of embedding space we're learning is embedding those similar diseases closer together. So even when we get a prediction wrong, it's still predicting it's somewhere closer in the, the tree than it would be in the, the other two, two models. So um, this was a, a good result that we, we were pretty happy with. All right, and then finally is uh, efficiency. So our models were vastly more efficient than the baselines, like orders of magnitude more efficient. Um, and a lot of this comes from the fact that our modeling is actually very simple. And the baseline models, while they're using kind of just TFIF vectors, the similarity matrices that they have to learn are massive. So they're learning a huge bilinear map between TFIF vectors, which are the size of vocabulary by the size of the vo vocabulary. So up to you know 20k by 20k matrix that they have to learn. Cool. So kind of the final tech takeaways from our work. Uh, one of the main things that we showed was that simple semantic features in modeling are enough to approach and, in some cases, um, achieve state-of-the-art on, on this task. And if you read the paper, you'll see kind of the nuance, on, nuance in this, in that we can kind of use, you know, very intelligent data augmentation and simple semantic features to be able to perform this while using a neural model. Um, and kind of one of the takeaways from that is that the data augmentation is absolutely critical. We, we rely very heavily on the concept ontology and the names that appear there, and kind of this modeling of concept embedding space as opposed to a you know, regular softmax classifier. Next is that our models achieve kind of higher prediction quality, which is you know, a good result if you want 
you know, not to predict diseases that are totally far off and have a bit higher prediction quality. Our model is more suited for that. Um, and then finally, and again, this is something, if you read the paper, you'll see some of the nuance in it, is that the utility of coherence appears to be domain dependent. Um, we don't see huge gains when we add the coherence model. We, the model performs pretty well with just the semantic features alone. Um, however, in kind of other domains that we've looked at, um, such as like bacteria, it appears that coherence might be a bit more useful. So with that, I'd like to you know, thank everyone for coming and seeing the talk. Uh, quick shout out to everybody that's worked on this project. It's a big collaboration between you know, people here and people at UCSD and a lot of really smart people who this work would not be possible without. So thank you very much. And if you want to check out the code, there's a link up there. Anyone wants to play it or do anything with it. So thank you. <laughs>